My name is Scott Ritter. I'm a former uh, weapons inspector for the United Nations Special Commission, um, the organization created by the Security Council to uh, conduct uh, weapons inspections in Iraq for the purpose of uh, disarming Iraq. Very good. And being one of the few people that's actually been to Iraq that's actually questioning the current U.S. policy, can you tell us what your assessment is of Iraq's weapons capabilities currently? Well, I think we have to start with what we know, and uh, that goes back to December 1998 when inspectors were last in Iraq. We know that as of December 1998, uh, we had accounted for 95 percent of Iraq's weapons of mass destruction capabilities. This isn't my number. This is the figure that comes from uh, Rolf Achaeus, the uh, Swedish diplomat who headed up the weapons inspection program from 1991 to 1997. Uh, he, he has stated, and I support his statement, that by 1996 uh, the weapons inspection program had fundamentally disarmed Iraq, that 95 percent of their capabilities were accounted for and disposed of, and that this includes 100 percent of the factories used by Iraq to produce chemical weapons, biological weapons, nuclear weapons, and long-range ballistic missiles, all of the associated production equipment uh, with those factories, and the vast majority of the product produced by these factories. Now, there is some uh, element of, the, of, of, of what Iraq had that's unaccounted for. We don't know what the final disposition of it is. But we can mitigate the concerns generated by this unaccounted for material by noting that from 1994 to 1998, the weapons inspection process had also um, imposed or implemented the, uh, the most strenuous uh, on-site inspection monitoring uh, program in the history of arms control. Uh, blanketing the totality of Iraq's industrial infrastructure with uh, no-notice inspections, uh, remote cameras, uh, sophisticated sensors, and uh, never once did we detect any effort by Iraq to retain that, that they retained uh, prohibited capability or were seeking to reconstitute this. So as of 1998, it's safe to say that um, Iraq's weapons of mass destruction capability no longer existed in terms of you know a manufacturing base. Now they had significant dual use capability, that is uh, production equipment that was used for legitimate civilian purposes that could be modified or adapted to produce weapons of mass destruction. Uh, but this isn't a problem so long as you have inspectors in place in country monitoring the use of this, uh, this equipment. But as I said in 1998, if you remove inspectors from the picture, Iraq could reconstitute significant aspects of the programs within a period of six months. Well, inspectors have been gone for nearly four years. So there is a real potential for Iraq to have rebuilt its weapons programs, and it's of grave concern. Hence the absolute requirement to get weapons inspectors back to Iraq. But um, you know we should be careful um, in, in when people say that you know, for instance, when the Bush administration says that they know Iraq has chemical weapons, they know Iraq has biological weapons today. Um, for the most part, when uh, asked to provide uh, you know the substantive the su substantive fact to back up these allegations, uh, they tend to point back to 1991, 1992, and say Iraq had the programs then, therefore they have them now. No. We disarmed Iraq. They didn't have the programs in 1998 when the inspectors left. So for Iraq to have weapons today, they would have had to reconstitute a manufacturing base since December 1998. And whoever says they have these weapons needs to demonstrate that this, in fact, has taken place. And there's been no evidence so far that the U.S. has brought forward that there are weapons being reconstituted? Well, there's evidence, circumstantial evidence, um, <laughs> rhetorical evidence. There's a lot of evidence. Uh, but it's not substantive fact. There's been no factual evidence brought forward uh, that, that makes that case. Can you think of any reason why, in part to national security, that they wouldn't bring information like that forward, that it would be a risk to the U.S. Uh, security if they were to reveal um, somehow that Iraq did, in fact, have these? I mean, you know what I'm saying? Right. It, well. Look, the Constitution of the United States clearly provides for circumstances in which the um, president may have information that can't be shared with the general public. Um, that's why Congress uh, has select oversight committees, uh, the Senate Select Intelligence Committee, the House um, Intelligence Oversight Committees. Um, it's incumbent upon the president uh, to share such sensitive, sensitive information with these uh, oversight committees. To date, no such intelligence has been shared with them. We likewise maintain classified relationships with uh, a number of countries, our allies, NATO allies, etc. Um, I think it speaks volumes 
uh, when we say that we are standing alone on this issue. Uh, because if we had this kind of substantive fact of the sensitive information that can't be shared to the general public because of its great sensitivity, um, we would certainly share it with our allies with whom we have classified information sharing relationships and we wouldn't be standing alone. Because trust me, if we could make a case that Iraq has these weapons, the world would support tough action against Iraq. The fact that we're standing alone speaks volumes for you know, the reality that this information doesn't exist. But let's take this another step. You know, History is replete with examples where the um, President of the United States has recognized the absolute requirement to justify the American people the potential use of American military force. Hence, in the Cuban Missile Crisis, John F. Kennedy showed the American public the U-2 photographs that clearly demonstrated Russian missiles in Cuba. Hence, when we had the Russians shooting down a, a Korean 747, the Reagan administration released the transcripts of the intercepted conversations from the Russian pilot to the ground control station showing that the pilot was under orders to shoot the airplane down. Hence, when we launched a military strike against the Sudan in uh, 1998, the uh, president authorized the CIA to disclose that we had a covert operative go to the Shifa bio, uh, the, to the, uh, bio uh, the pharmaceutical plant in downtown um, uh, Khartoum and take a soil sample and that sample revealed the presence of uh, chemical degradation byproducts that could be affiliated with a VX nerve agent. So there's a history of the presidency sharing sensitive intelligence information to make the case for war. We are talking about going to war against Iraq. We are talking about war that is justified by the threat posed by Iraqi weapons of mass destruction and the president claims to have you know, knowledge of the existence of these weapons, then it's incumbent upon the president to share how he knows this with the American public so we can support him in his war. Can you give us a sense of the Iraq's weapons capabilities in comparison to its neighbors in the region? Well, as of 1998, of course, Iraq didn't have any weapons capability in terms of weapons of mass destruction because we had fundamentally disarmed them. Um, you know, let's, let's, let's go around the block here. Um, start with Iran. Iran has long-range ballistic missile capabilities uh, that can go out to 2,000 kilometers. That's significant. Iran is uh, seeking to develop a nuclear weapon. Significant. There's good reason to believe that Iran has biological weapons. And we know Iran has chemical weapons in large quantities. So Iran has significant weapons of mass destruction. Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia has Chinese made, Chinese made intermediate nuclear, uh, or Chinese made intermediate range missiles. There's some discussion that the Chinese may have provided uh, nuclear weapons uh, for, these, for, these, uh, for these missiles um, under Chinese control, but uh, provides a uh, strategic deterrence to the Israeli nuclear capability. Israel themselves has <laughs> over 200 thermonuclear devices. Syria has missiles tipped with chemical weapons, probably has biological weapons. No, uh, Iraq lives in a dangerous neighborhood full of weapons of mass destruction. Um, you know, and you know, Iraq used to have you know, programs of a similar nature, uh, chemical, biological, nuclear, and long-range ballistic missile. These have been eliminated. Um, we don't know what their final disposition is because inspectors haven't been there for four years, but if inspectors go back in, um, then these programs will be certified as being eliminated. And that means that uh, Iraq will not have any weapons while they live in a neighborhood full of weapons. Currently, the um, administration is maneuvering to strengthen the UN resolutions on inspection. Do you feel that that's necessary? Uh, were the previous resolutions strong enough for you to carry out your job? Well, I think I've made it clear that we, uh, we achieved a fundamental level of disarmament, 95%. And that was under the old resolutions. So, absolutely, the existing resolutions uh, provide more than enough means to disarm Iraq. Uh, we have to put the current resolution being proposed in the Security Council into perspective. It's not about disarming Iraq, it's about going to war with Iraq. The current resolution puts uh, preconditions uh, for the return of inspectors that are so severe, deliberately so severe, that Iraq will never accept them. 
And if Iraq doesn't accept them, then the United States can cite this as uh, yet another example of Iraqi obstruction, and uh, the green light will be given for war. Currently in the media, they're still saying that Iraq threw out UN weapons inspectors. What's the truth to that? Well, the truth is um, weapons inspectors were ordered out by the United States of America two days before they began a bombing campaign that was triggered by American manipulation of the inspection process to provoke a confrontation with Iraq and then used intelligence information gathered by weapons inspectors to target Saddam Hussein in a manner which was um, outside the framework of uh, the mandate to disarm Iraq set forth by the Security Council. And all of this was done without Security Council uh, permission. So no, Iraq didn't kick the inspectors out. The United States ordered them out and then the United States corrupted the inspection process by using it in a manner which was had nothing to do with disarming Iraq and everything to do with going after Saddam Hussein. Now Iraq has said because the inspection process has been so corrupted, they're not welcome back in. But, and that's the situation we've faced for the last four years. Was that the first time that the U.S. had uh, played around with the weapons inspections there? No, and look, uh, the very heart of the, you know, the, the problem is that from the very beginning, the United States has been playing around with weapons inspections. Inspections were never intended to disarm Iraq. They were intended to provide a justification for the continuation of economic sanctions that would contain Iraq, destabilize Iraq. Um, you know, the, the law set forth by the Security Council states that if Iraq is found to be in compliance with its obligation to disarm, economic sanctions will be lifted. And yet as early as 1991, Secretary of State James Baker, then Secretary of State James Baker, stated that even if Iraq complies with its obligation to disarm, we won't lift sanctions until it's time Saddam Hussein is removed from power. America's policy of regime removal has always trumped disarmament. Therefore, the United States has always manipulated the disarmament work to achieve, to facilitate its policy of regime removal. Give us a sense of the amount of weapons of mass destruction that were destroyed by the UN weapons inspectors versus the U.S. bombing campaigns. Well, the U.S. bombing campaigns during Operation Desert Storm were extensive. They targeted uh, a number of Iraq's production facilities that were related to weapons of mass destruction, in particular ballistic missile, uh, chemical, um, to a lesser extent nuclear. Um, and we destroyed some weapons, uh, artillery shells, rocket shells, etc. But um, at the end of the day, when inspectors came in, what we found is that a lot of the bombing was actually ineffective. And uh, much of what Iraq had in terms of weapons of mass destruction and the production base for weapons of mass destruction was still intact. And we eliminated it. So the weapons inspection process was uh, far more effective on several orders of magnitude than, uh, than military action in terms of getting rid of Iraq's weapons of mass destruction. And yet I think part of the justification for the U.S. using military action against Iraq is that through this military action, we will somehow then destroy those weapons of mass destruction that they are holding over us. I think what the U.S. is saying is through this military action, we will remove Saddam Hussein from power and thereby able to ensure that all of Iraq's weapons of mass destruction will be declared to the weapons inspectors. They view the impediment of completing the process of disarming Iraq as being Saddam Hussein. Just this week, there was an article by, I believe, one of the former Swedish UN weapons inspectors saying that uh, there was a lot of, a lot more problems on the entire teams that were in there than I think had been revealed before. Did you, he was saying, for instance, that uh, it would be typical for someone to go and make extra copies of particular documents, and oh, yeah. people would, uh, when they weren't supposed to return to embassies at night, they would, some of them would. Um, did you see any examples of that when you were working there? Oh yeah, no, we fought a constant struggle. Everybody's talked about the battle of will between the weapons inspectors in, in Iraq, and truly there was. Iraq didn't want to be disarmed, and uh, we had a job of disarming them, and there was this uh, interesting conflict that the world is aware of. But there was another conflict the world's not aware of, and that is the battle of wills between the inspectors and governments seeking to use the weapons inspection process as a vehicle to gain insight into Iraq, which had nothing to do with disarming Iraq, i.e. spying on Iraq. And uh, there was a constant struggle to prevent, you know, uh, documents from being uh, 
uh, copied from information uh, which was collected by inspection teams to be passed to uh, governments without the approval of the weapons inspectors. Um, you know, it was a constant struggle um, from the very beginning. Tell us a bit about the methodologies you would use for detecting different weapons systems that uh, the UN wanted to find. Well, I think, first of all, we have to make it clear that uh, with one exception in the summer of 1991, the weapons inspectors never found a single weapon in Iraq. It just didn't happen. The concept of us kicking down the door and voila, biological weapon, never happened. But we disarmed Iraq. How did that occur? The same way a police department solves a crime. You know, very rarely do the cops go out into the woods and kick the dirt over and there's the body. What happens is the cops compel the criminal to confess the crime and lead them to the body. And that's what we did with the Iraqis. Through the process of our investigations, we put pressure on the Iraqis, we collected data, we collected uh, you know, uh, evidence, and uh, we confronted the Iraqis with this evidence. We interrogated the Iraqis over and over and over again and uh, highlighted the inconsistencies in their stories and in the end compelled them to confess, confess a crime, that they had a weapons program, and then to lead us to the bodies so that we could account for them and dispose of them. Uh, and it's this way that we disarmed Iraq. Um, you know, it was, it was a uh, very difficult job. It took a lot of time. Um, you know, in my case, every inspection team that I led into Iraq, and there were many, uh, was generally um, in initiated only after two to six months worth of um, research, intelligence work, traveling around the world, gathering data, uh, determining where we want to go into Iraq and why we want to go there and what we're looking for, and then gathering the requisite expertise. Uh, you know, do we need certain kind of sensors, et cetera. Uh, and the idea was to collect forensic uh, data, um, put pressure on the Iraqis, uh, you know, appear to close in on something that might be hidden, and then compel the Iraqis to confess a crime and take us to where the material is that we're looking for. Very successful. And then either you or the Iraqis would then destroy the material when you found it? Yeah, uh, the idea would be, well, sometimes it had already been destroyed. A lot of the stuff the Iraqis had blown up and just refused to tell us about it, and then we would uh, prove its existence, and they would take us to the dead body so we could click it off. On uh, other times when we found it, then um, generally what occurred is that it was destroyed by the Iraqis under our supervision in accordance with our criteria. So do you feel that Iraq is currently an imminent threat to the United States? No. I believe Iraq has the potential to be a threat to international peace and security if it reconstitutes its weapons programs. This is what international law says. It says Iraq can't have these weapons because these weapons in the hand of Iraq represent a threat to international peace and security. So uh, by definition of international law, if Iraq seeks to require it, they would be a threat and we need to deal with them. But in terms of Iraq representing a threat to the national security of the United States, to the region at this point in time, no. I don't see any evidence of that. Uh, if I could paraphrase, and obviously correct me if I'm wrong, <coughs> you, I believe you've stated that they need to allow, best thing is they should allow inspectors in, and if they don't cooperate this time, then, then what? They would, uh, Saddam would pay the severest price. But. That's really a determination for the Security Council. Remember, if you're going to speak of um, respecting international law, you have to respect the fact that, that the, 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 the answer of what the final accounting will be for Iraq is left up to the Security Council. Um, if it was my vote, I'd say military action, decisive. But it's not my vote, it's the Council's vote. And the other thing is, you, I think you have an obligation, at least I would, I would hope the Council would have an obligation to consider before going to war every alternative short of war to resolve this problem. Just because Iraq obstructs or is non-cooperative or non-compliant doesn't automatically mean we're going to war. It means Iraq needs to be held accountable. How they get, uh, you know, what that methodology is for, you know, accountability, that's the prerogative of the Security Council. And do you feel that until there was 
evidence of an imminent threat to us or other members of the world that it would be reasonable to continue pursuing perhaps diplomatic means or whatever to accomplish our goals here? Yeah, I, I think that uh, diplomatic engagement or other nonviolent uh, means of resolving uh, the, this situation should be pursued extensively until which time uh, either we have a solution or we're confronted with the fact that the only solution that will work is military force. I want to jump to, if I could, um, it was based on an interview you've done with Counterspin. One of the things that the U.S. Uh, brings up is that Saddam gassed his own people, you know, the, the Kurds. And yet there is at least one particular incident in there that I believe is still somewhat hazy as to whether Iraq actually gassed a specific village. Can you tell us about that? Well, I think the village in question is Halabja, which is most more often, uh, or most often, uh, presented as the, the most graphic example of Iraq's use of chemical weapons against its own population. I don't think there's any doubt that Iraq used chemical weapons in Halabja. The question is who killed the Kurds? Um, and there's good reason to believe that the actual gas munitions that killed the Kurds were fired by the Iranians, not by the Iraqis. This at least was the initial finding of the CIA in 1988. Um, eyewitness reports of the Kurds tend to back this up when they speak of, uh, you know, munitions that emitted a smell of, um, you know, rotting fruit, a fruit-like aroma. This is something that's more likely to be found in a cyanide-based uh, uh, chemical agent, which the Iranians used, as opposed to, you know, the, the more um, odorless nerve agent which would have been used by Iraq. So I think that there's you know, good reason to believe that the Kurds were killed by Iranian munitions. But having said that, Iraq still used chemical weapons against its own population. So we shouldn't uh, try and, 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 and cite this as an example that exonerates Iraq. No, they, there is no exonerating this regime. They use chemical weapons. They use them against the Kurds. They use them against the Iranians. That's a statement of fact and should be considered when uh, talking about you know, how we're going to hold Saddam Hussein accountable to the rule of law. What would be your proposal if you were in charge of things for the solution to what we're facing right now? I think we need to recognize a couple things. That um, regime removal is the policy of the United States. Too much political capital has been committed to the concept of regime removal to walk away from it. Um, disarmament is the policy of the international community. So we have to implement disarmament. Right now, disarmament and regime removal are linked by the United States. So you're not going to achieve disarmament. I mean, it's, 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 a, it's an inherently flawed policy process. I would de-link de the two. Also, sanctions. We need to recognize that uh, sanctions um, hurt the innocent Iraqi people and don't target Saddam Hussein. So what I would propose is to put weapons inspectors back into Iraq. Iraq has said it, it's agreed to be held accountable to the rule of law. I would de-link sanctions from inspections and say sanctions are lifted, inspectors are in. If you don't comply with the inspectors, it's not a matter of reimposing sanctions. It's a matter of us coming in and blowing you off the face of the earth. So there's your reason to comply. But then I would also recognize that the weapons inspection process, if Iraq is found to be in compliance, means that Saddam Hussein still continues to exist as the leader. We need to find a way to target Saddam. I think President Bush hit it on the head when he spoke before the General Assembly of the United Nations and said Saddam Hussein is a criminal. He's committed crimes against humanity. Then, Mr. President, indict Saddam Hussein as a criminal, as somebody who's committed crimes against humanity. Indict his senior leadership and then reimpose economic sanctions on Iraq. But this time, link the lifting of sanctions, in particular, Iraq's ability to sell oil to the Iraqi government, turning Saddam Hussein over to the International Court of Justice to be held accountable for the crimes he's committed. I believe that uh, this kind of pressure could result in Saddam Hussein being removed from power within a period of six months. And it's going to be done without having to resort to military action. <laughs>